our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. We're going to focus our attention today on the U.S. election. Young voters are poised to be a decisive force, many believe, in the 2020 election, with data suggesting record turnout from the group. So how does the young generation see the election? What about young people here in China? And what do they think about an election taking place on the other side of the Pacific? Earlier, I spoke to four of them who have been actually studying or living in the U.S. earlier. But before our conversation, let's listen to this first. Youth voters defined at the age of 18 to 29 years old generally turn out much less than other age groups, as was the case in 2016. But then, in 2018, we are seeing a very different picture. If you look at this, we are showing right here a youth wave emerged with historically high number of young people voting in the year 2018 in the midterm election. That youth wave is expected to research in 2020 presidential election. Non-Americans will also be watching the election very closely. And they are looking at the general picture inside the U.S. Among them are vast numbers of Chinese students who are studying in the U.S. or who are planning to do so. Faced with hostile policies and the pandemic, though, many of them are losing hope for an American higher education. But if you look at this graphic, you would certainly have a clear understanding about how many Chinese students actually are there in the U.S., particularly how they are compared in numbers to the others from different parts of the world. How much is at stake? How are young people taking the U.S. election that is days away? I talked to some of them, and let's find out their thoughts. And I'm so happy to be joined by a very young panel with me, Yunxin, Zichun, Yinuo, and Yang Fan. Good to see you guys. I want to thank all of you because I know you all went to sleep last night very late, right? <laughs> <laughs> you better tell our audience why is that and, and why is it related to what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I slept yesterday at 1 a.m. Uh, I was having a meeting with people all over the world, so. Mm, online meeting? Yeah, yeah, course. online meeting. Yeah? I went to sleep at 3 a.m. Uh, because I got out of the lab at 2 a.m. I went to sleep at 3 a.m. I had a meeting as well. Yeah. Yeah. 5 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a quite a competition. Yeah. <laughs> There's a very popular phrase right now called 打工人, but yeah. I have to say the, the hours of entrepreneur is much worse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, we are gathering here because we are all enthusiastic about uh, what's to come uh, after U.S. election, right? I know you guys have also been giving some thoughts to it. Tell me how that topic is being discussed among you, uh, supposedly Chinese young people. Uh, uh, young For me, an uh, entrepreneur in the international education industry, I care more about the future uh, border policies. Because we know uh, during the past year, uh, because of the pandemic, a lot of students cannot go to U.S. They have to take the Zoom University. And we've heard a lot of the <laughs> dramas. <Zoom University. laughs> uh, yes, a couple months ago, the ICE policy uh, influence a lot of uh, Chinese overseas students. I'm worrying about uh, an unstabilized border policy if Trump continues his presidency. So you think the other candidate mm -hmm. will make a difference? Uh, they will still try to reestablish their leading position in the global trading system, but I believe uh, education part will be much better than right now. Yeah. Mm. So the young, young entrepreneur is already thinking about what's next in terms of business, right? Yeah. The prospect of business. <laughs> what about for you? The both of you are still in school. Inhua. Um, I'm a psychology major at Cornell, so I really want to like focus on how the two candidates they appeal to their audience, like their targeted voters. So in terms of um, Trump and Biden, I think that Trump has a really strong personality. Um, I also, to I'm say thinking. The least of my dear. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in terms of like personality psychology, what I think is that the way he presents himself, he chooses to um, brand himself and present an image as being quite uh, very extroverted and very, um, you can say like disagreeable um, and very like uh, strong in terms, in terms of his opinions. So in this case, he's trying to appeal to the audience of, I mean his voters compared to Joe Biden are like uh, 
less educated and also in terms of Joe Biden it's really interesting how he presents himself as a person who is very like compassionate I mean he, he might he might um, is a person who is very compassionate but he presents himself that way as well and um, so Joe Biden like on the opposite he presents himself to be a very uh, mannered um, quite agreeable person but um, in terms of psychology I think if you um, pull back from how they appear on the screen in terms of how they really are behind the screen I think that maybe um, their personality might be similar um, in terms of how good or bad they are but the way they present th themselves on the screen get them to target the audiences that they want to target. Already some psychological studies <laughs> of the candidates. Uh, uh, what about for you? Oh, um, I'd actually like to start with a story. You know, I have this um, kind of, I guess, thing I do where I talk to taxi drivers all over the place. I assume various roles and I like to ask them about world issues. And funny thing, how many, taxi, how many taxi rides you had recently? <laughs> <laughs> a lot. <laughs> but funny thing, um, the common denominator for all these taxi drivers is that they're actually very concerned about this uh, election. And obviously, they're going to give the spiel where America's a mess right now. So I guess what I'm saying is really a lot of people are thinking about the results of this election, and it does matter a lot. But for me, though, I kind of try to have an outside perspective of this election. I think this is one of the biggest social experiment ever in history. So I think this is a perfect time for us as learners to reflect about, you know, what is democracy and where should we go next? Mm. Interesting. I know you are also now choosing a major of politics. Yes. In recent year, right? Yes. <laughs> wow. It's a very interesting time for you to look at that. And what about for you? Uh, for we me, are I'm looking at the numbers in the office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I do remember, like, uh, in 2016, which is when I was still in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where the Harvard Kennedy School, they had, like, a live broadcasting about the final election results with Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton. And at the time, I remember, basically, every one of my friends, like, they're so ready for Hillary, mm -hmm. and, you know, the media all portrays Hillary as going to be the first female president ever in the United States. But that night didn't went well that way, right? And uh, we, we have that um, celebration ready and like balloons, everything. But then, you know, with Trump winning Florida, oh, we saw like our dreams just shattered mm -hmm. right in front of our eyes. Um, and now it's like four years later, I am now sitting in Beijing and thinking about like, the four years how Donald Trump has transformed or changed American politics uh, landscapes. And now I think more than ever, including me or my friend, American friends or international friends as well, they're all very concerned about this election. You're all here in China for various reasons. Uh, uh, you are here studying and staying with your family, right? Even though you're American citizen, but you are working here, you are studying here, and you are study working here. Right. So, for various reasons, uh, what do you make of this, you know, so-called China factor in the campaigns uh, by the two candidates? Um, and do you think it's fair China is being portrayed in the way they did? Um, do you think that should be the way, or? should be the amount of attention paid to China by U.S. politicians, whether it is in this campaign or after the election result comes out? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very, actually a very good question. Well, I, I guess if I ask the taxi drivers, they would probably respond by saying, you know, China is a growing force and it's inevitable. And for that sentiment, I'd have to agree with them. The China factor, I think, in their discourse is inevitably, you know, it's inevitable. This political major person <laughs> is trying to hide his opinion behind the opinions of the taxi drivers. <laughs> That's a very smart way of putting it. Yeah. But yeah, um, China is a growing power in international politics. And for me, it's actually very disheartening to see that they're drawing this dichotomy between the U.S. and China as two opposing super forces. Mm. So I think, you know, from the American perspective, it's going to come out uh, in the presidential debates. Mm -hmm. They've talked a lot about China as a growing force yeah. and how to repress them. Both uh, candidates, if elected, I believe will continue on with this narrative about repressing China. And I think that's really inevitable. But from a grander perspective, you know, 
taking a step back. This is really something I don't hope to see because we're already seeing, you know, like Yang Fan talked about earlier, um, for us as students, as people who are trying to make a difference in the world, it's making life dif uh, more difficult for us. Do you talk about that with your friends or with your, you know, classmates, uh, those that are in the U.S.? Yeah, uh, for sure. They, they're actually super nice about it. And for that, I'm very grateful. They've been checking in on me. They, after ICE, the ICE thing, um, a lot of them have texted me and asking me if, if I was okay. Mm -hmm. And it really depends on which group of people you're talking to. Because exactly. America is such a polarized country right now. Yeah. So in California, I'm really gra grateful to have a group of people who are open and who are willing to discuss with mm. me. You know. Um, in terms of this, I really agree with what Pujo is saying. So, um, no matter who wins the election, I'm, I'm, I think that the relationship between the U.S. and China will not be, definitely not be as good as when uh, during Obama's presidency, let's say. But, um, however, like from a grand perspective, in the long run, I mean, uh, let's say if Biden wins uh, the election, well, he will have probably have a closer relationship with China um, in comparison to Trump, just because. Uh, he focuses like more on the environmental issues. So in terms of this, they may collaborate with China between, uh, like between the countries. And in terms of Trump, um, I mean he is a businessman, right? So he knows like his calculations, and he knows that um, in terms of the global economy, like it has to be global in order for every country to boom, right, for their economy. So I think in the long run, no matter um, how. Uh, the, rela the relationship between China mm -hmm. and the U.S. is like right now. In the long run, um, definitely, like as exchange students um, studying abroad in the U.S., we are contributing to the U.S. economy, and they are helping us as well. So it's a win-win situation in terms of this. Mm -hmm. Yang Fang, I know many of your friends mm -hmm. have already come back to China yes. because of COVID-19, yes. and your company, small one. Uh, last time I checked it, uh -huh. now already <laughs> become uh, a, an entrepreneurship of three or four hundred people. Yes, so it's enlarging very fast. fast. So, yeah. so tell me about how do they feel and how do you mm -hmm. feel about this U.S.-China thing? You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I believe uh, China is an uh, inevitable topic for uh, U.S. election because uh, both of the candidates are uh, portrayed themselves as so be tough on China. So uh, I believe, but there's still a difference. I think Trump is treating China, uh, Biden is treating China as a competitor. So I believe competitor is still different with enemy. Competitor will still can have uh, collaborations, uh, still have competition together. But uh, in terms of enemy, there's less cooperation, there's less trust, less mutual understanding. I believe that these are totally different. The education in China is also growing very fast. Mm. We have our own uh, top high-end institution. And maybe um, after many years, the top choice for Chinese elite students are not studying abroad, but stay in China and work in China and to uh, output our Chinese values to the world. You all talk about your own sense, uh, how you're making sense of the current situation. What about people around you? Um, when I was still at Cornell before the pandemic, um, before coming back to China, um, I really think that, well, first, like, ter in terms of uh, coronavirus, which Trump says is the virus from China, um, I don't think that those around me are very, uh, are in any way presenting, like, um, unfriendliness towards Chinese students at all. So in terms of that, it's 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 really good. Like the mm. culture at Cornell, at least, is really friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, we all believe that the leadership of America will try to distract the attention of their citizens and put the pressure more on China because they will have to transfer the, the attention to outside conflicts. We have to be adaptive. We have to uh, think one step earlier about this. What if it's just happened? and we have to have more choice, uh, have other ways to uh, get about the knowledge, to learn about the technology. And because of the pressure right now, we can see uh, Chinese companies like TikTok, like Huawei, they are making different strategies right now. Uh, I think it's a challenge, but it's also there are opportunities in it. It's opportunity for 
uh, China for Chinese company to uh, make their own live ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. Including yours? Yeah, including mine. Yeah, yeah, because we are um, thinking about uh, other revolutionary business model right now. <laughs> Which you wouldn't reveal to us. I could stand <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> what about for you, Yunxin? So I definitely think there's a lot of enthusiasm, there's a lot of confusion, and especially I think after COVID, when Donald Trump has repeatedly um, saying, you know, this is a virus from China, this is a chi Chinese plague, I think it's definitely like hurt our feelings, of course, uh, we as like Chinese people, or especially I think a lot of my friends, Asian American friends, they definitely feel more threatened, and this is not a good place to be in at this moment. So. Mm. Um, take my dad as an example. I go home every day and what he tells me is, son, look at America. There's another 80,000 cases on the rise. So I think from people around me, they're starting to get nonchalant about how things are going. They're, they're constantly focusing on how the election go is going, but somehow they're already numb about the way America is progressing. And that kind of concerns me too because there is a rise of hostility between Chinese people to how America is and American people to how China is. And I think for us as young, the young generation, like what Yunxin was talking about earlier, you know, it really is our duty to reshape the public discourse on this respect because with this trend, you know, it's not gonna be good for anybody for uh, international students, for businesses. So it's really up to us to educate ourselves and to influence the people around us to reshape the public discourse. But how? I mean, I can't travel to the U.S. right now. How would you do it? And how do you think we should be able to do it? When you talk about people to people, person to person communication, when you talk about what's going on in the other parts of the world, when you talk about what, how should we relate to them? Yeah, it seems like, um, Many times when American people are talking about China or Chinese people are talking about America, they are not talking about exactly the country or the people. They're talking to about like some of their own, like say, some information, secondhand information, like plus their own self-projections in the sense. So hmm, I guess interesting. Uh, what uh, Yang Fan just said about like mutual understanding and keeping an open mind, I think it is vital to have this mindset first to be in any kind of like meaningful discourse and conversations so that you have to understand each other better uh, even if sometimes it makes you kind of uncomfortable and feel like this is something your culture wouldn't be doing or this is something you wouldn't really do. What's so interesting about humanities or politics that's different from you know technology and science is that there is no true answer. It's really up to you to decide what is the most appropriate way to interpret a situation. And it could change from time to time. Exactly. So that's why I urge, you know, people who are watching this. I'm a STEM major who always thought that I was going to study science my whole life. But reading about politics, reading about news, and getting aware of the world really truly makes a difference to me as a person. You all talk about the mutual understanding. That's, to me, also extremely crucial. Um, what if people don't believe you? What, people, what if people think you have an agenda? What if they talk about um, uh, different kinds of scenarios as if there were conspiracies here and there all the time? Um, you know, what are you going to do about that? What if you explain and they don't listen? This kind of happened when, again, it was just before the pandemic, how um, Cornell closed and everyone had to go home. I was having the discussion with my um, U.S. friends, and then we were talking about how classes are ending and how serious this uh, coronavirus pandemic is. And how my, uh, my U.S. friends responded was that they thought that, that there was no point in closing down the schools, and they were kind of angry for having to um, go to Zoom University. So in terms of this, I found it to be pretty challenging, but what I did was the best that I could sharing my first-hand experience with them. Mm. And keep on doing that. Yeah. Mm. And for you? It doesn't render the endeavor, you know, meaningless, even though there are frustrating times. At the end of our discussion, I really want you 
well, I only have four young people, but um, in a way representing many of your friends uh, help us to understand to both the Chinese and the future U.S. leadership that are likely to come into the office after this election, what do you think they need to do? What matters the most to you? The thing that you think the two leaders or the leadership on both sides need to do? I think leadership is not about you singly stand out. It's about you champion for um, all groups of interest. Mm -hmm. Make education more important in the country. Oh, I'd say in the long run, definitely, uh, there should be just a better relationship. It's just a women situation. Mm. I think uh, it's built friendship with all the global players. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Yang Fan, Yi Nuo, uh, Zi Chun, and Yun Xin. Really appreciate it. You guys are great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.